Well, this time of year is a little crazy for my family. Maybe it's been a little bit crazy, crazy for you, but I have, I have a little few more things that make it a little crazy for us. See, today is gap day in my family. See, yesterday was my son's birthday and tomorrow is my daughter's birthday. So we pack in Thanksgiving and birthdays all to one big crazy lump. It's just fantastic. Uh, and and it's, it's a little bit uh, fun and frantic and uh, love my kids to death. And it's great to be able to celebrate their coming into the world. And uh, did you know that there are over 4 million babies born in the United States every year? There's nearly 4, 4 million. Is that right? Let me look again. What did I say? 4 or 4 million? Let me make sure I got that right. Yeah, it's close enough. Four million uh, births every year <clears throat> in the United States. Do you know what the most popular day or most uh, prolific day for births is of the week? What day of the week? What do you guys think it is? Wednesday. Wednesday. Anybody else? Wednesday. Monday, Friday. N- nobody loves Thursday. <laughs> There's no love for Thursday. Well, it's Tuesday, so don't worry about Thursday. Um, <laughs> It is Tuesday, and and the time of day, there's two times that are the most popular. Anybody know? Yes. Oh, my goodness. 8 a.m. Anybody else? The other one? Close. Noon. Yeah, it's 8 and noon is the most popular time on Tuesdays. Anybody know what month is the most popular? Anybody know? January. What else we got? I need somebody over here to talk to me. (laughs) February, what else, anybody? It is September. I don't know, you do the math, it's cold in January. So, um, how many September babies do we have? See all the September babies, you know what that makes you? Normal, okay, just, (laughs) no, you are extraordinary, just so you know, you're extraordinary. Uh, So many babies come into the world, so many babies have come into the world, But there's one that stands out from amongst all of us. There's uh, one that warrants our attention, and we make a very big deal out of his birth. We we have a whole holiday. As a matter of fact, we have a whole season that for retailers, now it starts in October, right? And this one that stands apart is the one that we worship, the one that is in the manger, the little baby boy. This is... The, the centerpiece of this celebration. And, and we sing songs about this little manger and this little boy. We, we decorate with nativity sets depicting the place of this manger that this little boy was placed in. And, and we have images and drawings and artwork of the manger, kind of like right behind me. There's this imagery of it. And we are, we are looking at this and we're surrounded by this in this season. And we're left in awe and wonder because this is none other than the arrival of God in the flesh. That's the centerpiece of this season. But, but here, here's the thing. If we come to the manger and this little baby and we leave him here and we let this season be all about the cute baby, all about the manger scene, all about the songs, the lights, the food, the party, the events, the feelings that we get this time of year, If we leave it there, we miss the point of this. You see, there there is a hope and there is a life and there is a freedom and a joy that he came to the manger to bring to you and me. And this season, we can't get stuck in this imagery and miss the reason for his arrival. There's a passage of scripture that is often referenced this time of year. And this passage gives us help in understanding and experiencing the reason for his arrival. 700 years before his birth, the prophet Isaiah foretold of his coming. He tells of a king that would be a great leader. And this leader would not be the like, like the leaders that people had known up to this point. This king would be the wisest king, the most powerful king, a king with the heart of a father and a king that would bring a peace beyond imagination. He would not reign for a period of time, but he would reign for all time. He would 
be on the throne reigning eternally. This leader would not arrive in some blaze of glory, but he would come quietly as a child. And this child would be called Emmanuel, God with us, God come in the flesh. So so let's take a look at this prophecy. It's found in Isaiah chapter 9. Verse 6, it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. There are four titles that are given to this leader, this king, in this passage. And these titles that are given to Jesus are more than just majestic sounding names. If you've heard this passage before, you might even be able to quote, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and they just sound big and glorious, and that's the feeling we get. But they're more than majestic names or titles. You see, in the Old Testament, they use names not just because they sounded pretty or they liked the sound of it or something of that nature. They gave names to things because the names described them. And so these are more than titles and names. They are descriptions of the character of this king that was foretold that now we know is Jesus. They reveal to us insight about who he is and how, listen, he wants to arrive, not just in a manger long ago, but in our lives today. How he wants to intersect where you're living right here and right now, arriving in your story. So those four titles, again, if you would, just read these with me, nice and loud, ready? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Today we're going to start with the first title and gain that insight that we need. The first title uh, is this, that Jesus is our wonderful counselor. Say it with me, ready? Wonderful counselor. Jesus is our wonderful counselor. How many of you uh, today would say that everything in your life is perfect? Show of hands. Hmm, interesting. All right. So no hands on that one. Uh, how many of you would, would say, you know, in my life, a little counsel would be helpful? Anybody admit that yet today? A few of you. Okay. A few of you. Some of you are getting elbowed. Put your hand up. Um, maybe there's something in your life that you're unsure about. I would wager that maybe, okay, I would guess all of us have something that we're not completely confident about in our lives. Maybe there's something we don't know what to do about it or how to handle it. Maybe it's how to be the person that we want to be, how to be the parent we want to be. Maybe it's how to be the friend we want to be. Maybe how to be the, the teacher that we want to be or the coach that we want to be. Maybe the friend that we want to be, the spouse we want to be, the leader that we want to be. And we, we're just not 100% sure how to be that. Or maybe we're wondering the best way to move forward in a situation. We're just, what's the best way to move in this thing? Maybe it's a relationship issue. Anybody ever have a relationship issue? Anybody? No? Just, okay, just me. Good. You're all lying. Anyway, um, wondering about that relationship issue. How do I handle this? What do I do about this? Maybe a financial issue. Do I, do I put money here? Do I save money there? Do I invest it there? Do I spend, like, what do I supposed to, maybe it's a work issue. Should I be at this job? Should I get a different job? How do I get a job? What if I get a job and should I do it this way? Where should I go there? Maybe it's a family issue, something going on in your family. And, there, and there's just this question about what I should be doing or how to do it. Wondering maybe uh, how to make something better than it is right now. There, there's something in your life that you look at and you go, you know what? That needs to be different. I just don't know the best way to get it there. Maybe we're just not sure about that. And knowing all the mistakes of our histories, knowing the, the feeling of regret from our less than perfect choices that we've all made, maybe, maybe a little counsel would be all right. 
Maybe we need a little bit of counsel to help us move forward. And if you feel any of that today, then this message is for you. And I'll just tell you right now that I know this message is for me. (laughs) Because I'm all that. And then some. Jesus is called our wonderful what? And so the image that comes to mind when we think of that, uh, it it may be different for all of us, but I want to make sure it is not something. It, It is not... Uh, an image that we need to hold of Jesus with glasses on the end of his nose and a yellow legal pad with a pencil and someone lying on a couch sharing their childhood. That's not the picture of the counselor Jesus that, that we need here. It's not the picture of a therapist who we emote to and tell our stories to and his whole job is just to make us feel better and leave better off. It, that's and I don't mean to minimize uh, the, the, the counseling and the therapy that, that is done, um, but that's not the image that this is to conjure in our minds when we think of the counselor that Jesus is. The image is more of a guide. The, the, the image is more of someone who is avi- advising you, advising me, giving us wisdom and insight and direction so that we might go the way we need to go in the way we need to do it. That's more of the image that we have. I remember when I was in college, there was a class and the class was divided into groups and the groups were supposed to meet outside of the class and and do this project together and then do this great big presentation. So we got together the first time and we all started talking and putting ideas on the table and nobody could come up with an idea that anybody liked. Nobody knew what to do about it or how to handle it. And we left and everyone was frustrated and a little afraid we're all gonna fail. We got back together for our second meeting, same outcome. I was like, this is crazy. We're not ever going to get this done. We got together for our third meeting, and one of our teammates that hadn't been at the first two came in, and we said, hey, here's what's going on. Here's, here's where we are, what we've talked about. And they said, well, then we just need to do this, this, do that, do that. Why don't you do this, 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 this? And we all went, that's it. We're actually not going to fail. We could actually get a grade above F because of what this person just told us. And afterwards, I pulled him and said, man, thank you so much. You saved us. We were going down and you saved us. Thank you for giving us the wisdom that we needed in this moment. And this is exactly where Jesus needs to stand in our lives. He needs to be the one that says to you and I, I know the best way. Here's how we need to do this. This is the idea of the counselor that we need, which is really great that Jesus is our counselor. You know why? Because we really need it. We need a wise leader. You and I need a wise leader. And we need him more than we realize. And why is that? Proverbs uh, chapter 14, verse 12, helps us understand this. It says, there is a way that what? It seems right. Yeah, this seems, yeah, seems right to a man. But its end is the way to what? That is not what we planned on. I thought this was right, but it ends in death. I was Way off, way off. This verse says, you aren't as smart as you think you are, and neither am I. It's kind of offensive, actually. Oh, you think you've got this figured out? Yeah, you're going to die. Like, that's what it's telling you. Like, you think you're so smart. Things seem good. You think you got the right call, and then it blows up on you. Anybody ever have a decision made blow up on you? Four of you are willing to admit that so you're just hanging your head. Okay, yeah. Um, in, uh, in high school, uh, I, I got home before my mom did one day, and she was having me put some things in the oven and heat things up and get things ready for dinner, and then she'd be along. And, and she put out a note for the wicker basket full of bread to heat it up. And, and she said, heat it up, put it in the microwave, and she meant to put in four, ten seconds. But what came out was for 10 minutes. And being the wise teenager that I was, I just went, okay. And I put it in the microwave for 10 minutes and I walked away. A little while later, you know, six, seven minutes later, I came back into the kitchen and smelled and saw haze. And I went, do you know when you put a wicker basket with bread in the microwave for like seven, eight minutes, um, do you know what you get? Fire, that's what you get. Uh, Started a little fire in in the microwave. It was really great. Um, (laughs) You see, my mom's directions in that moment were not just a little off, they were way off. And because of it, the bread did not make it. There was a way that seemed right, and in the end, led to death for my bread. Like, it was just 
crust, right? Just black crust. The way forward for you and I that seems right in that situation, in what you're dealing with that person, in the way that this seems right to me is often fraught with pitfalls and challenges and really, really bad things that leave you burnt to a crisp that you don't see coming. It seems right, but you end up like a wicker basket full of bread in a microwave, and it's no place that you and I want to be. What we need is wise counsel. We need guidance. We need a leader that's going to point us in the right direction. We need a wise leader. The reason, the reason why our bad decisions seem right to us is a deeper issue. It's not just because, well, we got that one wrong, or, you know, we just need to think a little bit better this way. We need a little bit more smarts or a little more information. There's something way deeper at work here. You see, there's a core issue that affects every single decision and every move that you make and that I make. There's something inside of us that isn't right. And that thing that isn't right, it causes us to lose sight of what is actually good and right. It causes us to be most concerned with ourselves and our motivation behind our choices, even our good choices, our, our, our well-intentioned choices, it's actually selfish underneath it. And it causes us to value the wrong things, to pursue things that are not actually good and right that glorify God. There's something in us that steers us in the wrong way so that when we look at it, we go, that looks right. But in the end, it leads to death. This thing that is in us that is not right is what scripture calls our sinful nature. The sinful nature. And, and, and this idea of sin is not just doing the wrong thing. Bad. I did the wrong thing. Sin. That is the evidence of the sinful nature, the root cause of the, the behavior that is not right is a desire that's inside of us to do the wrong thing. We all have a sinful nature. We've all inherited this sinful nature and it causes us to see things upside down, to fly upside down. And what we need is wisdom and guidance outside of ourselves to turn things right side up, to lead us in the right direction, to lead us out of our sin-tainted ways that seem right into the ways that are actually right, that are good and glorifying to God. We need a wise leader to step in, one that will give us wisdom like no other. Again, really good news on that front because Jesus is the one to do that. He has the kind of wisdom that you and I need. You see, his title isn't just counselor. It's what? It's the wonderful counselor. And that word wonderful, when you look back in the original language, the Hebrew in which this was written, it, it, it references the ideas of being extraordinary, marvelous, astonishing. And there's the connotation of being supernatural. Every time this is used, almost every time it's used, like 80 times in the Old Testament, it's referring to the supernatural work of God. That is the above human ability that only God has. In Isaiah 55, 9, look what it tells us. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. His thoughts, his ways, his wisdom is higher than ours. I'm not saying that all human wisdom is bad. It just, listen, isn't enough for everything we need. And his is so much better than the human wisdom around us. His wisdom stands apart from human wisdom. There is absolutely, listen, no comparison to our wisdom, to his wisdom. They're miles apart. When I was in college, I went on a uh, short-term mission project to the Philippines. And I lived six weeks in the Philippines and I spent some time in a squatter village in a little shack with uh, an expatriate missionary there. And for breakfast, he gave me a mango. Fresh Filipino mango. Cut it open. I hadn't really had mango before. Uh, and pull out the big seed in the middle and take a scoop. And I was like, oh, 
This is amazing. This might be the best thing I've ever put in my mouth, ever. Like every morning I'd wake up, we have mangoes, we have mangoes. I just want a mango. And so I get back after six weeks of amazing mangoes. And I go to the grocery store. I'm like, I need mangoes. And I bring the mango home. I cut it open, I open it, I pull the big seed out, and I take a scoop, and I'm like, mm, I want to throw up. This is... <laughs> There's a, there's a mild, okay, maybe significant difference between fresh Filipino mangoes and store-bought Illinois mangoes. Can, you, know, it, you see the difference? There's a, there's a huge, huge difference. There's no comparison. And there's absolutely no comparison to, I think I've got this figured out. I think I have the best wisdom. I've got the best ideas ever. And God, you're probably right there next to it. Your ideas are probably pretty good, but mine, mine actually edge yours out, or I'm really close to yours. There's no comparison between our wisdom and his. His is supernatural above any human wisdom that there is. No comparison to his wisdom. And there's so many places that we look for wisdom, and we might not even realize that that's what we're doing. We're looking for solutions to the stress we feel. I don't like the way it is. I don't, I'm afraid of what's going to happen. That needs to change, and I don't know how, so I try to create a solution. And the place that I go first for wisdom in my world is me. You see, I've got this pretty well figured out. I think I can solve most everything in my life. How about you? You got it pretty much on lockdown, too? This is where I go. My instant reaction to anything, big or small, is, let me think about it. Yeah, I think I got this one figured out. I'm pretty wise. I'll, I'll take care of this. That's never gone down in flames. Um, that's a daily occurrence, actually. And when we go beyond ourselves, the places we look next is typically to our friends, the people around us, the people that, that we love, our family. And we say, hey, give me a little bit of insight. I've pretty much got it figured out. I just need a little bit more. What do you think? Okay, great. Now we're good. And when we go beyond that, we start looking to places that actually, when we stop to think about it, we don't even realize we're doing this. We're looking to people for wisdom in leading our lives like professional athletes and actors and social media influencers. Listen, because I can run fast and I can quote lines off of a script in a convincing way, or I'm beautiful or I can make funny videos, doesn't mean that I know how to run your life. Let's stop asking those people how to do life, okay? Our wisdom comes from places we don't even know we're gathering it. We're always on the lookout to find a little better information. Give me that meme, maybe that'll change my life. How about that little insight? Oh, I'll do that. We're always looking for something to improve. So many different sources, but, but, but listen, what we're doing when we do that in comparison to the wisdom of God is we are dumpster diving for wisdom when there's a Thanksgiving feast of it hanging out over here with God. That's what we're doing. And we're going, this will work. <laughs> think, think for a moment who it is that we're talking about when we're talking about our wonderful counselor, Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, sovereign over all creation, who made you, made me. That's who we're talking about here, Okay. Let's get the right guy in mind when we're talking about the wonderful counselor and why he put on flesh and blood coming here. He didn't come here for a cradle. He came here for a cross. He came here because you had a debt you couldn't pay. So he came to pay a debt he didn't know. He put on flesh and blood to go to a cross to die in your place and my place to pay for our sin, to rescue us freeing us from the power and the penalty of sin in our lives so that we could be reunited, reconnected with him in an eternal relationship. He did this so that we might live differently with him in charge of our lives, with his spirit inside of us, empowering us and directing us, with his wisdom guiding us, with supernatural wisdom. Wow, he came here to do that, to be our wonderful counselor. Listen, Jesus is the wise leader that we need. He's the one. We need to look no further. Jesus, Jesus has the kind of wisdom that we need. Not only do we need a greater wisdom than we bring to the table, 
Not only does Jesus have that wisdom, but here's the incredible reality. His wisdom is not hiding from us. It's readily available. Supernatural wisdom is waiting. Supernatural wisdom is waiting. In the New Testament, in the book of James, he writes this. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So the, the, the beginning place in this short passage is this. If you lack any wisdom, how many of us would fall in that category today? I lack a little wisdom in my life. Anybody? Let, let me just hold it up for you. This is you. This is me. We're all here, right? I mentioned a minute ago, but, but when you feel stress in your life, anybody ever felt stress? I'm just checking. Okay. When you feel stress in your life, you know what that is? That is a siren going off that there is something that you need wisdom for. I don't know how to handle this. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm frightened about this. I don't know what to do or how to do it. Ooh, ooh, stress. So let stress be the key that points you to the reality that you lack wisdom. You see, if we, we, if we take this idea that he's my wonderful counselor to only the biggest things in my life, here's the two things I'm going to ask him to give me wisdom for. We're missing the day-to-day, everyday kind of moments that seem smaller, but when I feel stress, let it be this siren that says, you need more wisdom than you have. To... to, to To realize I have a lack of wisdom is the first step. And so it's this, that you and I, we need to admit we need wisdom. We got to admit it. We have to stop long enough to go, you know what? I don't have everything I need here. We have to take a great big handful of humility and say something like this. I lack the wisdom I need, which is really, really hard because you and I have worked our entire lives to get to a point where we can say, I got this, I can handle it myself. And to say, I don't got this, I can't handle this myself, is tough. It's really tough because our pride is huge and it doesn't like, it doesn't like to admit it can't handle it. In Proverbs chapter one, it says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. What he's saying is that if we're unwilling to push aside our pride and acknowledge that we need God, we are acting like fools. If we're not willing to say, "I, I don't have what I need, I feel stressed, I need something I don't have. If we're not willing to say that, We are fools. The wisest thing that you and I can do is to humble ourselves and admit we lack the wisdom we need. That's the wisest thing we can do. I don't have what I need. I don't have what I need. So the second thing that this passage points us to is this, that after we admit we need wisdom, we ask for that wisdom. The passage simply said, let him ask God. Let him ask God. So let me really break this down for you and get into the nitty gritty. You know what it means to ask God? To ask God. It's really that simple. It's not complicated. It's really just saying, hey, God, I need you to do something here. It's really that simple. We don't have to make this complicated. God, I don't have what I need. I believe you do. Will you provide, please? Please provide this for me. But don't expect anything if, first of all, you haven't asked. Man, I have a problem. I don't know why God hasn't done anything about it. Have you asked him? Well, no. This passage doesn't say, if you lack wisdom, just hold your breath. It'll be great. It says, ask him, ask him. Have you asked him? 
Well, I haven't really gotten around to that. I was so stressed. That's the siren. Listen and then ask. God, I need your guidance. I need help. I need your wisdom to go the right way on this. Please give me your wisdom. Not complicated. We admit we need it. We ask him for it. And then he tells us how we're to ask. This is important. He says, ask confidently. Not confident in your circumstances, not confident in yourself, but confident in him. In who? In him. We ask with confidence, expecting God to give us the wisdom. It says, ask in faith, meaning I believe you will, with no doubting. Don't doubt. God, I need you to help me with this. Oh, I sure hope he comes through. Wrong. God, I need this. But what if he doesn't? No. It's God, I need this. (laughs) I know you're going to do it. You know, the easiest thing that I have found to help me move from a place of wishing, throwing wishes at this guy, God, help me with this, and try to do it myself, to go from this throwing wishes, kind of doubtful, hoping the best, but not really expecting much, to go to a place of confident expectation is simply to thank him in advance. Say, God, I don't have what I need. I need your wisdom. Would you give me your wisdom in this situation? Thank you. Thank you. I believe you're going to give it to me right when I need it, the way I need it. Thanks. When you say thank you to him, there's something inside of you that says it's already done. That's why I'm saying thank you. And if it's already done, then I can count on it happening. Like, I believe you're going to take care of this. I'm already thanking you. And so we say thank you in advance And then we trust that he will give me what I need, right when I need it, how I need it. We even let our shoulders down. I don't see a solution yet. This is stressful. Put a little smile on our face. But I know you got it, Lord. You're going to provide what I need when I need it. Thank you. But here's what you need to know. When God gives wisdom, it's not always what you expect it to be. But he will give you the guidance that you truly need. Maybe he shows you that your true intentions are actually emanating out of a heart of selfishness. God, what do I do about this? And this needs to happen. And he says, you know why you want that to happen? Because it's all about you. You know what actually needs to happen is this. And you go, that wasn't the wisdom I was looking for, but I guess, I guess that's right. You know, that seemed right to me, but that might be the way of crusty bread in a microwave. I need to go this way. Thank you, Lord. And he gives you the wisdom that you couldn't come up with on your own, and it may not be what you think it's going to be. Maybe he shows you that you're making something more important than him. God, this needs to happen. I really want this to happen. This is the answer, the solution. Can you, can you give me wisdom on how to do this? And he goes, that? Do you realize you are actually um, worshiping something else? You're valuing something else, expecting it to satisfy you in the way that only I can satisfy you? So no, you need to do this instead. You go, that was wisdom I wasn't expecting. And maybe, maybe you need to... Um, Maybe he shows you that you need to apologize instead of fix the other person. I know that doesn't apply to anybody in this room. Um, Where we say, God, just give me wisdom to help them be different. And God goes, let me start with the one who's wrong, you. Ooh, ooh. I'm supposed to apologize, not fix? Oh, that wasn't the wisdom I was looking for, God. But you're probably right. God will lead and guide you in ways you don't expect the moment you trust him to give you the wisdom that he says he will give. When you turn to him believing, you ask him, he will deliver. I'm gonna invite the musicians, if you guys would come back up. We're gonna worship again together in a moment. We need a wise leader. Jesus has the kind of wisdom we need. Supernatural wisdom is waiting. So here's the question for us. What direction, guidance, and wisdom do you need today? Where's the stress in your life? Where's the, what am I supposed to do about this? How do I get here? How do I make this different? How do I, what's the question that you are asking? Where do you need guidance? What is that? And whatever that is, our next step is to look to Jesus because he is the wise leader that we need to lead us forward. Because Jesus is our wonderful counselor. This is the leader, the king who gives us a direction and a guidance we desperately need. So I want you to imagine 
I want you to imagine being given wisdom in a place where you're stressed, you don't know the answer, you can't figure this thing out. Maybe it's just a little thing you think, it's not too big, but you're given the wisdom to lead, to, to follow his leadership in a better direction than you had before. Can you imagine that happening? And then more times than not, you're submitting to his leadership when you ask for it, and he's leading you into places you never thought you'd go, and things are different. The impact of your life is different in the people around you. You're seeing your neighbors start to turn their attention towards Jesus. You're seeing your family change the dynamic. You're seeing your coworkers and your workplace change and your influence is changing. And you're not burning in the microwave as many times as you used to be. Things are changing. Can you imagine that happening in your life? Can you imagine wisdom coming to you that gives you the way forward that you never would have conceived of on your own into a life of more meaning, purpose, joy, hope, and freedom. The wonderful counselor has arrived. The question is, will you let him arrive in your life? Will you let the wonderful counselor arrive in your life? Heavenly Father, we are in need of wisdom today. We acknowledge that. We are not self-sufficient. We weren't meant to be. We were meant to be dependent on you, and you have everything we need. We thank you for your grace and your love that would willingly come here on our behalf, that would willingly supply what we need to travel the right road. And so today, as, as we're praying right now, as you think about that direction, the guidance, the wisdom that you need in your life today, would you just begin by admitting that you need wisdom you don't have? Would you just, in your own words, in your own heart and mind right now, between you and God, would you just tell him, I need your wisdom. I don't have what I need. And now will you just ask him for it? We just ask him to give you the wisdom that only he can give you. And will you put your confidence in the fact that he will deliver? Would you tell him thank you in advance? We continue to pray. Jesus arrived here as a child to grow up and pay for your sin and mine that we would be forgiven and that we would be made right with God, that he would become the rightful king in our lives. And he invites us to come and put our trust in Jesus, to call on his name and to be saved from our sin. And when we do that, we step into a relationship with him that changes everything now and forever. And so today, if you would say, I am ready to turn my back on being the one in charge of my life, I realize that he needs to be the king of my life. And if today you're ready to admit that you can't do anything about your sin, but he did everything necessary to pay for your sin and forgive you, and you're ready to trust in him to rescue you from your sin and make you right with God, and on, then his invitation is simply for you to come to re receive the salvation that he is offering to you today. And so if you would say, that's me, I want to give you words to tell God your heart and receive that gift of salvation. I'm going to pray a very simple prayer. I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer, repeating after me, just to give you words to share your heart with God. So if that's you, in the quietness of your heart, would you pray this prayer with me? Dear God, I need a Savior. I can't save myself. I believe Jesus lived, died, and rose from the dead to be my Savior. I choose to turn to you now, calling on your name. 
giving you my life, trusting you alone to save me. Help me to live the rest of my life for you who gave his life for me. Thank you for saving me today. It's in your name, Jesus, that I pray. And all God's people said, amen. And would you stand together, church, and would you welcome into the family of God those who gave their lives to Jesus today, amen?